This is part two in our series on community ecology. In part one, we introduced the idea of niche and the idea that the potential niche and the realized niche are often uh, not the same. That if we look at it, one species might be able to fill a broader part of the habitat, but in reality does not due to competition with other species and interactions with other species. So the idea of looking at interactions between species brings us to the idea of and the idea that we don't um, realize our fundamental niche or our potential niche but only the realized niche brings us to the concept of competition. And there are two types of competition. Intra-specific and intra means uh, within and inter-specific competition which is between species. And the interesting idea here is that competition within a species is more fierce than competition between species. The question is why? I actually want you to stop the video now and write down some reasons why you think intraspecific competition is more intense, more fierce than interspecific competition. So think about what it is that organisms compete for. They compete for limited resources space, food, water. And they also compete for, uh, they compete in reproductive uh, behaviors, competing for mates and access to mates. So things within the same species will have um, the exact same requirements. So they'll be competing for the exact same resources. Whereas between species, while they may have some overlap and some similarities, they may not be competing for the exact same resources. There's two types of competition. In one, everyone has equal access to resources, but some are better exploiting the, those resources. In two, uh, another type of competition is where some individuals control access regardless of the abundance of the resources. Any two species will differ in their adaptations for getting food or avoiding enemies. Thus, one will usually compete better. If two species require identical resources, then they cannot coexist indefinitely in the same area. This is called the principle of competitive exclusion. To restate it, we could say that no two organisms can occupy the exact same niche. If they overlap too much, they will compete, and if they compete, one will eventually win and, event and exclude the other one from that, um, that habitat. Now, that organism or that species could occupy the same niche in a different habitat, but not in the same area. Now, the, one of the reasons we don't see as much uh, intense competition between species is that we have this concept called resource partitioning, where competing species will coexist in the same area by subdividing a category of similar resources. When you look at a complex community, you often see what looks like uh, the result of a lot of compromise, as if all the organisms in the community came together at a summit and said, okay, look, you get this, I'll get this. You take that area, I'll take this area. And what we're seeing, though, is not the result of uh, uh, them sitting down at a summit, but um, years of competition and adaptation such that those individuals that have managed to survive have done so because they've kind of carved out their area of the, of the, uh, the resources. And so we're seeing what's left over after that carving out. And we call that resource partitioning. And we'll show some examples of that in just a moment. But first, let's look at an example of competitive exclusion. Now, the classic study has been done with uh, two species of paramecium. And recall that paramecium uh, is a type of protist, a single-celled animal-like protist. Um, it's a celiophora. It has lots of cilia. This is a, my excellent drawing of one. And if you looked at how these organisms would grow in population uh, alone, if the paramecium aurelia were um, in this environment alone, its population size would grow in a, in a typical curve that we'd see, a logistic growth curve, and it might look like that. And the other species, uh, paramecium caudatum, in the absence of competition, would grow in a very similar manner. It would grow until it reached the carrying capacity of its environment. But when the two are in the same environment, they're in the same habitat, this doesn't happen. They will compete. And in competition studies, it's shown that the aurelia 
are better suited for that competition. And as they both start to grow, as the population of both increase, eventually the Aurelia get the upper hand and outcompete the Caudatum and suppress that population size and eventually would eliminate it from the habitat. Now this happens because these two species uh, have very similar niches. They overlap and require uh, the, almost the exact same resources. Now over time, maybe uh, due, due to this pressure, um, one of the two of these might change in their requirements or have an adaptation such that they change what they would use and maybe they could coexist in the same area and essentially do what we call resource partitioning. So here's a, let me look at this graph and bring it to the front. We have two species here who have niches that overlap. And in this area of competition where they overlap, um, eventually they may diverge and uh, not overlap as much. Now each of them then has a less of a range or less of a breadth of their niche, but as a result of, we lessen competition. If we lessen competition, that's good for everyone. Uh, an example of this is found with these different species of warblers. They can coexist, these different populations, because they're not using the exact same locations. They, they vary, uh, are very um, particular about which areas of the trees they'll use, and they basically just stay out of each other's way. I have one more example down here of these two similar types of lizards and how they, in this one area, uh, again, basically stay out of each other's way. One of them prefers to be out in the sunny areas and finding food in those areas, and the others tend to stay in the shade. So they can be in the same area, uh, have similar niches, but they don't overlap too much. Now in the last part of our discussion, on, uh, in this last part, we're going to talk about how these community interactions have led to um, dri have driven evolution and also a concept of coevolution. We'll start with coevolution. When a change in one species acts as a selective force on another species, and then the counteradaptation of the second species in turn affects the first species, we have kind of a revolving wheel here where, uh, let's say, for example, let me go back up here and move this up to the front. Uh, let's say that each generation, uh, the slowest of the gazelles get eaten by all the cheetahs. Well, the cheetahs then have selected for the success of the fast gazelles. So they, each generation, the population of gazelles get faster. Well, then the slowest of the cheetahs starve, and the only cheetahs that survive are the fastest cheetahs, so then they get even faster, which then causes the population of the gazelles to get even faster. And, you know, maybe sometimes it's not about faster. In one generation, they get smarter about how to sneak up on them, and then the gazelles get better at hearing them sneak up, and you can see that you're running and running and running and getting nowhere. This type of coevolution uh, is, is, you can see lots of these examples of coevolution. Of course, I was exaggerating a little bit with that one, but hopefully I, I made the point. There's a lot of interesting examples that this has been shown with um, um, plants and their pollinators and um, how they've evolved together to um, um, make that system very specific. Um, let's look at some other types of evolutionary um, results of um, community interactions. How about this one? Cryptic coloration. Do you see a lizard here? Might take a minute to see it. And a moth here? Well, these adaptations, this cryptic coloration, have evolved as a result of the competition or the interaction with predators, and it has driven this evolution. What about the opposite idea? How about not blending in but standing out? How can this have evolved? Well, sometimes avoiding predation is a good thing. Another way you could avoid getting eaten is to tell everyone where you are and to stay away. We call this aposmatic coloration. It acts as a warning. It tells other animals that you're dangerous or noxious or poisonous and that they'd be best to just avoid you. An interesting thing that's kind of spun off an evolution of this, like a, a spin-off series, is the idea of mimicry. What happens if we have two species that look similar? Well, in the case of Mullerian mimicry, um, both of these species are dangerous, meaning these two different species of wasps, which look similar but a little different, are both uh, have stingers. And so an animal 
would have learned to avoid one of these would also then learn to avoid the other one. It sees the similarities and they benefit each other by increasing the total number of models that can be learned to be avoided. They mimic each other. We see this with these all every one of these uh, species of butterfly are all uh, poisonous and an animal only has to learn to avoid one to then learn to avoid them all. We call this Mullerian mimicry. In this case both are either poisonous or dangerous or unpalatable. A different type of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry. And Batesian mimicry uh, is when the model is dangerous, poisonous, or unpalatable, but the mimic is harmless. But the mimic benefits greatly by looking like the model. Now this only works if the models outnumber the mimic. If there were more mimics than models, then the learning that would occur from the other organisms would be that this pattern is harmless and there's only a few that are that are harmful but if there are more models than mimics uh, there's a great benefit for these non uh, non dangerous makes to have the same pattern and again both of these types of mimicry are employing aposmatic coloration they're going to stand out and be very obvious that they're either dangerous or very obvious that they might be dangerous and that concludes our uh, community ecology section of our ecology unit